Zork 2 is a different animal than Zork 1. I mean, it feels the same at the beginning. You start the game without any real idea of what you're supposed to do, and by exploring, picking up objects, riddling out clues, and solving puzzles you eventually figure out, you have to go from here to there by doing these things so that you can move on to Zork 3. In that way, it's very similar. In fact, almost the exact same premise as when you come down to it. I would even say the balloon puzzle is a lot like the raft puzzle from a certain point of view. In essence, much like Zork 1, Zork 2 is a giant treasure hunt, except there are less treasures, and they do not actually end the game. Oh, and they can be filched from you, hidden away, and if any are missing, you do not get the maximum score when you complete the final objective. You can actually complete the game with as many as 20 points less than the maximum of 400 points, but you still completed it, and that is how we're going to approach it. Completing even if we do not have all 400 points. More on that later. Why? Well, why not? I cannot guarantee a full score, and with how long these take to make, you get what you get. Awkward silence. Three, two, one. Did you know Zork 3 has 50 different ways to die? No joke, 50 different ways. According to the Infocom scoreboard of the spring of 1984 New Zork Times, page 3, that is more than Zork 1 or Zork 3. And did you know it's widely considered to be much more complicated than Zork 1? Especially for people who are not familiar with baseball, the great American pastime. So we start the game with our lamp and that elvish sword, both from the last game, you remember, the sword we dropped in the troll room? It magically follows us, and we will need it. We will face a bunch of puzzles, which I do not consider to be very hard, but there is the Wizard of Froboz who likes to appear and cast spells on us. Some are useful, but others are not. And one, Flores, makes it impossible to complete the game. Now, according to the Infopalm catalog, Zork 2 was actually released for the TRS-80 Model 1. However, I'm not configured for running a disc of that size on Tristos, so... As a treat, you're going to get to see me load up the game in an alternate yet completely compatible system called LDOS. The L stands for logical, as it is by logical systems, and despite the fact that I almost always default to TristDOS when working with you here, I have to say LDOS is a much superior disk operating system in comparison to the alternatives. So as you can see here, this is a TRS-80 Model 1 Radio Shack Level 2 BASIC. And the first thing I'm going to do is hit the reset button and boot it into Tristos. You can see here Tristos Disk Operating System version 2.3, DOS ready. And if we type directory, it's important to note, we type directory, we get the Tristos disk. And I know my Tristos disk still has Bedlam on it. I am sorry, it just is something I've never removed. Instead, what we can do now is we can look at our directory of our first drive. And we can read that this has the Zork 2 disk in the drive, but we cannot actually play Zork 2 from this. So let's move over to booting from LDOS. Let me change out the disks here. Over to LDOS 531, which is a patched version to allow for modern time codes because the old time codes do not work properly. So today is the 7th of April, so we're going to go 0407, and it is 2020. And then it asks for the time, and the time is 1414. And it tells me now that it is ready. This is LDOS 531 that was released in 1991. Now, if we run a directory, you will notice that the first thing it does is instead of just looking at the first drive, it looks at both drives. We have here at the top the LDOS disk, and then below it we have the drive 1, Zork 2, ready to go. And we load it the same way we load a Tristos by just saying Zork Two. 
Sork 2, The Wizard of Frobaz, copyright 1981 by Infocom Inc., all rights reserved. Sork is a trademark of Infocom Inc., release 23, serial number 1. Inside the Barrow. You're inside an ancient barrow hidden deep within a dark forest. The barrow opens into a narrow tunnel at its southern end. You can see a faint glow at the far end. A sword of elvish worksmanship is on the ground. A strangely familiar brass lantern is lying on the ground. And if you look up there at the top, it says we are inside the barrow. We have a score of zero and moves of zero. If you've joined me for many of my Let's Plays in the past, you will have noticed that one thing I do in advance is I prepare a sequence that I'm going to go through so that we progress through the game in a logical fashion. Another thing you will have noticed is I often refer back to previous playthroughs of games that we have done together before. In this case, I'm going to reference back to the Zork 1 playthrough that we did on the TRS-80 color computer where the sword of elvish workmanship, or the elvish sword that we used in game, when I picked it up, I picked it up instead of saying sword, I used the term orcrist. And I mentioned that you could also use the name glamdring. So let's illustrate here that we can get glamdring. And this picks up our sword. Now, give me a moment, I'm going to take us back so that I can also illustrate how the get all works in this situation. Now look at that. Through the miracle of editing, I have restarted the game and brought it back to this position. Now what we want to do here is get all. Now we could use get all or we can say take all. And if we get all, the game is going to take both the sword and the lamp. Now let's start moving around here. And the first thing we want to do is head south. Narrow tunnel. You are standing in the southern end of a narrow tunnel where it opens into a wide cavern. The cavern is dimly illuminated by phosphorescent mosses clinging to its high ceiling. A deep ravine winds through the cavern with a small stream at the bottom. The walls of the ravine are steep and crumbly. A footbridge crosses the ravine to the south. We're going to go south again. Footbridge. You are standing on a crude but sturdy wooden footbridge crossing a deep ravine. The path runs north and south from here. South again. The Great Cavern. This is the center of a great cavern carved out of limestone. Stalactites and stalagmites of many sizes are everywhere. The room glows with a dim light provided by phosphorescent moss, and weird shadows move all around you. A narrow path winds southeast among the stalagmites, and another leads northeast. We are going to go southwest. Shallow Ford. You are at the southern edge of a great cavern. To the south, across the shallow ford, is a dark tunnel, which looks like it was once enlarged and smooth. To the north, a narrow path winds among stalagmites. Dim light illuminates the cavern. We want to go south. You have moved into a dark place. It is pitch black. You are likely to be eaten by a gru. Let's light our lamp. Dark tunnel. This is a dark tunnel with a dim light to the northeast. The tunnel is smooth but dusty and filled with debris. Twigs and leaves, which become deeper as the tunnel branches, a wide corridor leading southwest and a narrower one southeast. Here we want to go southeast. North end of the garden. This is the northern end of a formal garden. Hedges hide the cavern walls, and if you don't look up, the illusion is of a cloudy day outside. The light comes from a large growth of glowing mosses on the roof of the cave. A break in the hedge is almost overgrown to the north. A carefully manicured path leads south. In the center of a rose bed is a small open structure painted white. It appears to be a gazebo. Now one thing you will notice is it's common in many games for there to be a centralized location that we work from. Usually it's a place where we're supposed to bring treasures and we get our score for bringing the treasures there. But in this case, it's just the gazebo because this is where a lot of the items that we need for multiple riddles or multiple puzzles start and we are not going to pick them all up and use them all at once. 
Now, in order to get into the gazebo, we need to enter gazebo. Now, before playing this game, I thought gazebo was spelled with two E's, but apparently it's only one E. Now, this is a gazebo in the midst of a formal garden. It's cool and restful here. A tea table adorns the center of the gazebo. Sitting on the table is a matchbook, a china teapot, a placemat, a newspaper, and a letter opener. The other reason is, of course, the tea table. I am a big fan of tea. Now let's start with the puzzle that requires the teapot. So let's get the teapot. And then we want to get out of the gazebo. And we go north. We're back in the dark tunnel, and then we go northeast. This is the shallow ford. And let's get water. We're filling the teapot with water. The teapot is now full of water. So let's go south. Back to the tar dark tunnel. south, And then we go south to the formal garden. This is the middle part of a formal garden. Hedges hide the cavern walls and a dim illumination comes from mosses far above. The path is of small crushed white stones. It winds among the bushes and flower beds from south to north. To the north, a small structure can be seen. To the south are peculiarly shaped bushes. There's a small gap in the hedges to the west. We are going to go to the west. Path near stream. The path follows the south edge of a deep ravine towards the northeast here. A tunnel heads southwest, narrowing to a rather tight crawl. A faint whirring sound can be heard in that direction. On the east is a ruined archway, choked with vegetation. Here we are going to go southwest and hope that we end up in the right place. Carousel Room You are in a large, circular room whose high ceiling is invisible in the gloom. Eight identical passages leave the room. A loud whirring sound comes from all around, and you feel sort of disoriented in here. Now, the location we want to get to is called the Riddle Room, and it is to the southwest from here. But because we're in the Carousel Room, we're not exactly certain which direction we're going to leave from. The direction we want to go is southeast. And because we're in the carousel room, we can't exactly tell which direction we're going to go from here. So let's hope we're facing the right direction. You're not sure which direction is which. Something about this room is very disorienting. The Minhir room. This is a very large room, which is evidently used once as a quarry. Many large limestone chunks lie helter-skelter around the room. Some are rough-hewn and unworked, others smooth and well-finished. One side of the room appears to have been used to quarry building blocks. The other produces minhirs, standing stones. Obvious passages lead north and south. One particularly large minhir, at least 20 feet tall and 8 feet thick, is leaning against the wall, blocking a dark opening to the southwest. On this side of the minhir is carved an ornate letter F. Now, the minhir room is actually south, not southeast. So we need to go north again, back into the carousel room, and try it again. This is the room we wanted to go to. You're not sure which direction is which. Something about this room is very disorienting. The riddle room. This is a room which is bare on all sides. There is an exit down in the northwest corner of the room. To the east is a great closed door made of stone. Above the stone, the following words are written. No man shall pass this door without solving this riddle. What is tall as a house, round as a cup, and all the king's horses can't draw it up. If you want to take a moment and think about that, just hit pause. I can wait. Now the answer is a will. There is a deafening clap of thunder, and the stone door quietly swings open to reveal a passageway. If you think about a well in the traditional sense, they're this round structure that you draw water from, and it has a roof 
and it's tall, but it's not as tall as a house. You have to think of it in terms of tall going down instead of tall going up. Or at least that's how I have interpreted it. So we want to go east from here. The Pearl Room. This is a former broom closet. The exits are to the east and the west. There is a pearl necklace with hundreds of large pearls. Let's get the necklace. And then we want to go east again. This is a circular room. This is a damp circular room whose walls are made of brick and mortar. The roof of this room is not visible, but there appear to be some etchings on the walls. There is a passage to the west. There is a wooden bucket here, three feet in diameter and three feet high. So let's have a look at these etchings. What this is, is this is a disc-shaped logo that is supposed to say Frobo's Magical Well Company. So let's get in the bucket. And now we want to do something that is kind of magical. And by magical, I mean that the solution to the puzzle doesn't make sense according to the land of physics. What we are going to do is pour the water out. There is now a puddle in the bottom of the wooden bucket. The bucket rises and comes to a stop. Top of well, you are in the wooden bucket. You're at the top of the well. Well done. There are etchings on the side of the well. There's a small crack across the floor at the entrance to the room to the east, but it can be crossed easily. The wooden bucket contains a quantity of water. Let's examine the etchings here. As you can see, it says here, Frobaugh's Magical Well Company. So let's get out of the bucket. You're out of the wooden bucket. You are on your own feet again. And we're going to go east. Tea room. This is a small room containing a large oblong table, no doubt set for afternoon tea. It's clear from the objects on the table that the users were indeed mad. In the eastern corner of the room is a small hole, no more than four inches high. There are passageways leading away to the west and the northwest. There is a large oblong table here. Sitting on the large oblong table is a cake with lettering in green icing, a cake with red icing letters, a cake with orange icing letters, a cake with blue icing letters. A strange little man in a long cloak appears suddenly in the room. He's wearing a high pointed hat embroidered with astrological signs. He has a long stringy and unkempt beard. The wizard draws forth his wand and waves it in your direction. It begins to glow with a faint blue glow. There is a loud crackling noise. Blue smoke rises from out of the wizard's sleeve. He sighs and disappears. Luckily, what he attempted to do did not work. Now, as you see there, there are different cakes. There's a green cake, a red cake, an orange cake, and a blue cake. So let's get red cake, blue cake, and green cake. These are the ones that we need to use, the red, the blue, and the green. Now there's experimentation that goes on that we can tell what the cakes do, and they're not all friendly. Now, for starters, let's read green cake. The icing spells out, eat me. But if we read the red cake, you will see the first letter is a capital E. The rest is too small to read. And this is true with the other cakes, is we're unable to read the lettering on them. So let's go ahead and eat the green cake. Suddenly, the room appears to have become very large, although everything you are carrying seems to be its normal size. Posts room. This is an enormous room, in the center of which are four wooden posts delineating a rectangular area, above which is what appears to be a wooden roof. 
In fact, all objects in this room appear to be abnormally large. To the east is a passageway. There is a large chasm on the west and the northwest. There's a group of wooden posts here. Now we want to go east to the pool room. This is a large room, one half of which is depressed. Salty water flows from a large leak in the ceiling. The only exit is to the west. A stoppered glass flask with a skull and crossbones marking is here. The flask is filled with some clear liquid. The leak has submerged the depressed area of the pool of tears. There is a hazy something at its deepest part of the pool. Now with the cakes, you could have experimented, and if you experimented, you would have found out that each cake does something different, and one of them is really bad. It causes you to explode, and that's the one we left behind. But what we can do is we can read red cake with flask. The flask distorts and magnifies the cake with red icing letters showing details not noticed earlier. The letters now visible say evaporate. And now let's read blue cake with flask. The flask distorts and magnifies the cake with blue icing letters showing details not noticed earlier. The letters, now visible, say enlarge. So let's use the evaporate. We're going to throw the red cake in the pool. Most of the pool evaporates, revealing a slightly damp but still valuable package of rare candies. So let's get the candy. And then we want to head west again. So we are back in the post room, and here we want to eat the blue cake. So we are now back in the tea room. We were always in the tea room. Just now we recognize it as a tea room instead of posts being, of course, the legs of the table. And now we go northwest. Low room. You're in a circular room with a low ceiling. There are exits to the east and southeast. There's a green piece of paper here. There is a robot here. So let's check out this green piece of paper. Frobos Magic Robot Company. Hello, Master. I am a late model robot trained at GUE Tech to perform various simple household functions. To activate me, say the following. Tell robot something to do. Carriage return. The pair of double quotes are required. At your service. So let's drop the paper, because we do not need it anymore. Now what we want to do is tell the robot what to do, and what it needs to do is go and be the solution for another puzzle for us. And this puzzle could get us killed if we do it wrong. So what we're going to do is tell the robot to go east and push triangle. There are multi shaped buttons and the triangle is the one that we want robot to do and we will follow the robot i just like saying go east and push triangle instead of go east and then going east with the robot and then saying robot push triangle because it's more button presses more steps i should say whir buzz click the robot leaves the room whir buzz click a dull thump is heard in the distance so let's go east. You cannot get your bearings. Tea room. There is a large oblong table here. Sitting on the large oblong table is a cake with orange icing letters. And since it sent us the wrong way, we have to go northwest again. And then we are going to try going east again. Machine room. This is where we wanted to go. Cannot get your bearings. Machine room. This is a large room full of assorted heavy machinery, whirring noisily. The room smells of burned resistors. Along one wall are three buttons, which are respectively round, triangular, and square. Naturally, above these buttons are instructions written in EBCDIC. A large sign in English above all the buttons says, Danger, high voltage. There are exits to the west and south. There is a robot here. That, by the way, 
is a computer programming joke of that era. Instead of ASCII, the American Standard Code for Information Exchange, IBM equipment often used the EBC DIC, the Extended Binary Coded Decimal Interchange Code. The more you know. And now we are going to give the robot another command. Tell the robot to go south. The robot leaves the room, and then we will go south. Dingy closet. This is a dingy closet adjacent to a larger room to the north. Chiseled into a wall are these words. Protected by Froba's Magic Alarm Company. Hello, footpad. A footpad is, well, we are. It's a thief. There doesn't seem to be any footpad here. However, there's a robot here. There's a beautiful red crystal sphere. We want that sphere. However, it's protected by the alarm. As you reach for the sphere, a steel cage falls from the ceiling to entrap you. To make matters worse, poisonous gas starts coming into the room. Cage. You are trapped inside a steel cage. So let's tell the robot to lift the cage. We certainly cannot do it, and we do not want to be around this poisonous gas for very long. The cage shakes and is hurled across the room. It's hard to say, but the robot appears to be smiling. Dingy closet. There's a beautiful red sphere here. Let's get the sphere again. And then let's get out of here. We want to go north to the machine room. West to the low room. This is where we first encounter the robot. And then we want to go south. And it takes us back to the tea room. From here, we are going to go west. This is back to the top of well. Now let's get back in the bucket. And remember we poured water out into the bucket. Now we want the water again. If we took more than 100 turns while we were out and about, the water would have evaporated and we would be stuck where we are, impossible to end the game. So we have now taken the water and the bucket descends and comes to a stop. Let's get out of the bucket. And we no longer really need the teapot. So let's drop it. And then we're going to go for a little bit of a walk into the pearl room, into the riddle room and northwest into the carousel room. Here in a large circular room whose high ceiling is invisible in the gloom. Eight identical passages leave the room. There is a dented steel box here. Let's open the box. Opening a steel box reveals a fancy violin. Let's get the violin. Trivia for you, by the way. I used to play the violin. I haven't in many years. And maybe someday I would like to pick that back up. Let's go east. Into the topiary. This is the southern end of a formal garden. Hedges hide the cavern walls and mosses provide dim illumination. Fantastically shaped hedges and bushes are arrayed with geometric precision. They have not recently been clipped, but you can discern creatures in the shapes of the bushes. There is a dragon, a unicorn, a great serpent, a huge misshapen dog, and several human figures. On the west side of the garden, the path leads through the rose arbor into a tunnel. So let's head back to the gazebo. So we go through the formal garden. We go to the north end of the garden again. And we enter the gazebo. So here is a matchbook, a placemat, a newspaper, and a letter opener. Now let's drop everything that we are carrying except for, and we use a but for that, the lamp and the sword. So we're going to drop all but the lamp and the sword. So we drop the violin, we drop the crystal sphere, we drop the package of candy, and we drop the pearl necklace. 
and then we want to get the mat and letter opener. And then we want to leave the gazebo and let's head back the direction we were coming from earlier. So we go south through the formal garden and south to the topiary. Then we go west to the carousel room. And from here, we're going to go north to the marble hall. This is an arched hall of fine marble. The hall stops abruptly to the north at the ford across a stream where the marble is cracked and broken. Perhaps a flood or collapse of the cave was responsible. To the south, the hall opens into a large room. There's a rather annoying whirring sound coming from that room. There is a square brick here which feels like clay. So let's get the brick. Something of interest for you here is that in the original version of Zork or Dungeon, before they broke it into three separate games, this brick of clay could be found in the attic of the White House. But since it was not useful in the first game, it was superfluous, and we instead find it here. Now from here, we want to go north to the deep ford. You're fording the stream at a deep but not impossible spot. The water is very cold. The walls of the ravine rise to the east and west. There is a small ledge along the north wall of the ravine. To the south, here is an entrance to a well-constructed but somewhat ruined hall. We're going to go north again. This is the ledge of the ravine. You're on a narrow ledge near the bottom of a deep ravine. The ledge continues to the west. A precarious climb up to another tiny ledge is possible. A short scramble down the rock face leads to a stream. We are going to go up. Tiny room. This is a tiny room carved out of the wall of a ravine. There is an exit down a precarious climb. On the north side of the room is a massive wooden door, which has a small window barred with iron. A formidable bolt lock is set within the door frame. A keyhole covered in a thin metal lid lies within the lock. Now, if we examine things here, we will notice that if we look through the keyhole, we can't see anything. And, well, let's just do the puzzle and we will see. What we want to do is we need to use an old trick of putting the mat under the door. So we slide it and it fits easily under the door. Now let's open the lid. This is the keyhole covering the thin metal lid. The lid is now open, and then we want to put the opener in the hole. The reason for this is that the key is in the hole, the key is in the hole, blocking our use. So let's put the opener in hole. I misspelled it previously. There's a faint noise from behind the door, and a small cloud of dust rises from beneath it. Done. So the key has been pushed out of the hole and it's fallen down onto the mat. So let's take the mat. As the mat is moved, a rusty iron key falls from it and onto the floor. And let's get the key, because we wanted the key. And then we want to get the opener, because it's plugging the hole. And then we unlock the door with the key. That's quite a lot of steps for such a simple puzzle. The door is now unlocked and we open the door. And from here we are going to go north. Dreary room. This is a small and rather dreary room, eerily illuminated by a red glow emanating from a crack in one wall. The light falls upon a dusty wooden table in the center of the room. On the south side of the room is a massive wooden door, which has a small window barred with iron. A formidable bolt lock is set within the door frame. A keyhole lies within the lock. The edge of a placemat is visible under the door. In the center of the table sits a blue crystal sphere. We want the sphere. And now we are going to head back to the gazebo. And to do that, we have to head south to the tiny room then go down the ledge in the ravine, and then we go south again 
to the deep ford, south to the marble hall, south to the carousel room. We go east to the topiary, and then we go north into the formal garden, north again to the north end of the garden, and enter the gazebo. As you can see, this is where we dropped our pearl necklace, the package of candy goods, the beautiful red crystal sphere, and now they're calling it a Stradivarius instead of just a violin. Something else you will notice is there is now a unicorn peacefully cropping grass at the north end of the garden, and there is something hanging around its neck. Now let's make use of that drop all again. So drop all but lamp sword and brick. And then we want to get the newspaper and the matches. Now the newspaper, much like the brick, was also originally in the White House, except this time, instead of being in the attic, it was in the living room. Now let's Go ahead and head out. Still a beautiful unicorn here cropping the grass. And we are going to go south to the formal garden, south again to the topiary. Then we're going to head west to the carousel room. And this time we're going to go southwest to a cobwebby corridor. A winding corridor is filled with cobwebs. Some are broken and the dust on the floor is disturbed. The trend of the twists and turns is northeast to southwest. On the north side of one twist, high up is a narrow crack. There's a coil of black braided string here. We want to get the string. And then head north to the lava tube. Here in a tight chimney of solidified lava, it extends up at least another 100 feet and down to a large room far below. A large crack opens to the south, probably the result of a shift in the rock strata. Here we want to go down. Ice room. This is a large hall of ancient lava, since worn smooth by the movement of a glacier. A large passage exits to the east, and an upward lava tube is at the top of a jumble of fallen rocks. A mass of ice fills the western half of the room. Here we go east to the cool room. This room is cool and damp. The air is misty. A twisty path from the southeast splits here toward a wide northerly stone bridge and a narrow westerly tunnel. It is from the latter that a mist and chill seem to originate. Let's go north. Stone bridge. This is the middle of a ruined but still impressive stone bridge spanning a deep chasm. Water flows beneath. A paved path leads to the north into a large open space. South, the path leads to a misty tunnel. Your sword is glowing with a faint blue glow. You remember from Zork 1, when the sword glows, there is danger. But we're going to keep heading north to the Dragon Room. The Dragon Room. This room is a large cavern full of broken stone. The walls are scorched and there are deep scratches on the floor. A sooty dry smell is very strong here. A paved path winds from a large passage to the west, through the room, and across a huge stone bridge to the south. To the east, a small crack is visible. A dark and smoky tunnel leads north. A huge red dragon is lying here, blocking the entrance to a tunnel leading north. Smoke curls from his nostrils and out between his teeth. Your sword has begun to glow very brightly. Now, our initial response is to attack the dragon, but we're not trying to kill the dragon. In fact, we can't kill the dragon. We can attack him multiple times, and then he will kill us. Instead, just attack the dragon once here. So we attack the dragon with the sword. Dragon hide is tough as steel, but you've succeeded in annoying him a bit. He looks at you as if deciding whether or not to eat you. The dragon continues to watch you carefully. So let's go south. This is the stone bridge, and we want to attack the dragon again. And it says the exact same thing. 
So again, we want to go south. So now we are at the cool room and the dragon follows us out of a mingled curiosity and anger. And we want to attack the dragon one more time. The dragon hide is as tough as steel, but you have succeeded in annoying him a bit. He looks at you as if deciding whether or not to eat you. He continues to watch us carefully. So what we want to do now is head west. This is the ice room. A mass of ice fills the western half of the room. As the dragon enters, he sees his reflection on the icy surface of the glacier at its western end. He becomes enraged. There is another dragon here behind that glass, he thinks. Dragons are smart, but sometimes naive, and this one has never seen ice before. He rears up to his full height to challenge this intruder into his territory. He roars a challenge. The intruder responds. The dragon takes a deep breath, and out of his mouth pours a massive gout of flame. It washes over the ice, which melts rapidly, sending out torrents of water and a huge cloud of steam. You manage to clamber up a, to a small shelf, but the dragon is terrified. A huge splash goes down his throat. There is a muffled explosion, and the dragon, a puzzled expression on his face, dies. He's carried away by the water. When the flood recedes, you climb gingerly down. While no trace of the dragon can be found, the melting ice has revealed a passage leading west. Your sword is no longer glowing. So now we want to go west. This is the lava room. There is a small room whose walls are formed by an old lava flow. There are exits here to the east and south. On the floor lies a Moby Ruby. So let's get the Ruby. That is Moby, not Moldy. And then we want to get out of here by going south to the volcano bottom. You're at the bottom of a large dormant volcano. High above you, light enters from a cone of the volcano. The only exit is to the north. There is a large and extremely heavy wicker basket here. An enormous cloth bag is draped over the side and firmly attached to the basket. A metal receptacle is fastened to the center of the basket. Dangling from the basket is a piece of braided wire. What this basket is, is part of a balloon. And we want to get in the basket. We are now in the basket. And we open the receptacle. opened. Now we put the newspaper in receptacle and then light a match. One of the matches starts to burn and then we light the newspaper with the match. The newspaper burns inside the receptacle. The cloth bag inflates as it fills with hot air. A small label drops from the bag into the basket. The match has gone out. Let's read the label. Hello, aviator. Remember hello, sailor, before? To land your balloon, say land. Otherwise, you're on your own. Nor warranty expressed or implied. Let's drop the label. The balloon rises slowly from the ground. Volcano core. You're in the basket. You are about 100 feet above the bottom of the volcano. The top of the volcano is clearly visible here. The cloth bag is inflated and there is newspaper burning in the receptacle. A braided wire is dangling over the side of the basket. The basket contains a blue label. The receptacle contains newspaper. Now we want to wait again. Time passes. The balloon ascends. You're still in the basket. Volcano near the small ledge. You're about 200 feet above the volcano floor. Looming above is the rim of the volcano. There's a small ledge on the west side. The cloth bag is inflated and there is a newspaper burning in the receptacle. A braided wire is dangling over the side of the basket. The basket contains a blue label. The receptacle contains a newspaper. So here we want to go to the west. Narrow ledge in the basket. You're on a narrow ledge within an old dormant volcano. This ledge is about halfway between the floor below and the rim above. There is an exit to the south. 
The cloth bag is inflated. We've already read all of that, but on the floor is a priceless gold sork mid, a valuable collector's item. We want to tie the wire to the hook. The balloon is fastened to the hook. A strange little man in a long cloak appears suddenly in the room. He's wearing a high-pointed hat embroidered with astrological signs. He has a long, stringy, unkempt beard. The wizard draws forth his wand and waves it in your direction. It begins to glow with a faint blue glow. There's a loud, crackling noise. Blue smoke rises from out of the wizard's sleeve. He sighs and disappears. Now let's get out, because luckily, once again, none of his spells worked. We're on our feet again. And let's get the coin. This is a Zork Med. Now we want to go south to the library. This must have been a large library, probably for the royal family. All of the shelves have been gnawed to pieces by unfriendly gnomes. To the north is an exit. There's a purple book here. There's a white book here. There's a blue book here. And there is a green book here. We want to read the white book. It is written in an unfamiliar tongue in the details the use of various magical items, chiefly the so-called magic wand. Apparently, these devices work by pointing them at the target to be ensorcelled and then chanting the appropriate magic words. It's truly amazing how credulous these ancients were, isn't it? So let's drop the book and let's check our inventory just to be safe. And then we want to open the purple book. Opening the purple book reveals a flathead stamp. So let's get the stamp. Now let's head north, back to the narrow ledge. We want to get in the basket and then untie the wire. The wire falls off the hook. And then we do what we did before. We wait. Time passes. The balloon leaves the ledge. Volcano core. So we are back in the volcano core. We're at a volcano near a small ledge. And we continue to wait. We are at the volcano by the viewing ledge. You're high above the floor of the volcano. The rim of the volcano looks very narrow, and you're very near to it. To the east is what appears to be a viewing ledge, too thin to land on. So we are going to wait again. Volcano near the wide ledge. You are near the rim of a volcano. Above you, it is open to the sky. To the west, there is a place to land on a wide ledge. The cloth bag is inflated and there is a newspaper burning. We've already been through all of that. What we are going to do is we are going to go west. You're on a wide ledge high above the volcano. The rim of the volcano is about 200 feet above, and there is a precipitous drop to the bottom. There is a small door to the south. There is a small hook attached to a rock here, outside the basket. So we want to tie the wire to the hook. And then get out. And then we are going to go south. To the dusty room. Here in a dusty old room, which is featureless except for an exit to the north side, embedded in the far wall is a rusty box. It appears to be somewhat damaged since an oblong hole has been chipped out of the front of it. So now let's make use of that brick of clay we got earlier. Let's put the string, remember the string, in the brick. Put string in brick. Again, I warn you, my keyboard sometimes double punches the letter in. Done. And now we put the brick in the hole. And from here, we want to light another match. One of the matches starts to burn. Light 
string with match. And then we want to get out of here because the wire starts to burn. And we do that by going north. So we're back on the wide ledge, and as you see here, there is an explosion nearby. So we go back south to the dusty room, and on the far wall is a rusty box whose door has been blown off. The room is cluttered with debris from an explosion. The walls seem ready to collapse. The excessively gaudy crown of Lord Dimwit Flathead is here. The box contains a card. So let's get the crown and the card. Now let's examine the card. Warning, this room was constructed over very weak rock strata. Detonation of explosives in this room is strictly prohibited. Froba's Magic Cave Company, per M. Agrippa Foreman. So let's get out of here. And we do that by going north. And here we want to get in basket. You are now in the basket. You may recall that recent explosion. Probably as a result of it, you hear an ominous rumbling as if a nearby room had collapsed. So let's untie the wire. The wire falls off the hook. Now, remember when we first started using the balloon, we had to open the receptacle in order to allow the heat from the burning newspaper to fill the balloon and lift us up. So now we want to close receptacle. And then we just wait. So we are heading back down. Notice the ledge has collapsed. And we continue to wait as we descend until we finally get down to the volcano bottom where the balloon has landed. And here we want to get out and head back to the gazebo. So we go north to the lava room, east to the ice room, east again to the cool room, southeast to the carousel room, east to the topiary, north to the formal garden, north again to the north end of the garden, and we enter the gazebo. Sounds like the title of a Bruce Lee movie, Enter the Gazebo. Now let's drop all but the lamp. That's a lot of things to drop. And then we want to head back out. So let's go out and then south to the formal garden. The unicorn is peacefully cropping the grass at the north end of the garden. There is something hanging around its neck. Go west to the path near the stream, southwest to the carousel room, and then we go north. It says our lamp appears a bit dimmer. Well, we're gonna go north again to the deep ford. This is where the dead dragon is now lying. And we're gonna go north one more time to the ledge in the ravine. And we're gonna go west from here to the end of ledge. Ledge from the east ends here and a tunnel leads north into the wall. There's a rather odd smoky odor in the warm air of the tunnel. Let's go north to the dragon room and north one more time. This is the dragon's lair. We've not been here yet. A rotten old wooden chest is in one quarter among the debris. A beautiful young woman wearing a dirty and bedraggled gown sits on a rock in the corner. Her hair is unkempt and she is oblivious to your presence, almost in a trance. So let's get the chest and then a strange little man in a long cloak appears suddenly in the room. He's wearing a high-pointed hat embroidered with astrological signs. He has a long, stringy, and unkempt beard. The wizard draws forth his wand and waves in your direction. It begins to glow with a faint blue glow. The wizard, in a deep and resonant voice, speaks the word fierce. He cackles gleefully. You rush at the wizard, intending to tear him limb from limb. The wizard mumbles something under his breath, and just before you reach him, he vanishes. Now, 
as per traditional fairy tales, in order to bring a princess out of some kind of trance, you need to kiss the princess. The princess, for she is obviously one, shakes herself awake and then notices you for the first time. She smiles. Thank you for rescuing me from that horrid worm, she says. I must depart. My parents will be worried about me. With that, she arises, looking purposefully out of the lair. So let's head back to the gazebo. And I hope you don't mind if I just go ahead and take us south, and then south to the stone bridge, and south again to the cool room, where we go southeast, and then east, and then north and north, and then enter the gazebo. See all of these things we've brought here? Like I said, this becomes the center of the game. And now, let's wait. The princess has joined us in the gazebo. Shyly, a unicorn peeks out of the hedges. It notices the princess and seems captivated. It approaches her and bows its head as though curtsying for her. Around its neck is a red satin ribbon on which is strung a delicate gold key. The princess takes the ribbon and uses it to tie up her hair. She looks at you, then smiling hands you the key and a fresh rose which she plucked from the arbor. You may have use of such a thing, she says. It's the least I can do for one who rescued me from a fate I dare not contemplate. With that, she mounts the unicorn, side saddle of course, and rides off into the gloom. So now, let's open the chest. The rotten wooden chest opens. Nestled in the chest is wrought a gold statuette of a dragon. So let's get the dragon. And then drop chest and rose. We feel cooler and less angry. The spell is wearing off. Get the candy, red sphere, blue sphere, and pearls. And then we want to head out. From here we go south to the formal garden. South again to the topiary. The animals seem to have changed position slightly. We don't want to spend too much time in the topiary. We can get attacked here. We go west again and then south. Remember when we went to the Minhir room? And south again to the stairway. A marble stairway leads down into the gloom and a passage leads north. We are going to go down. Oddly angled room. This is a room with an oddly angled walls and passages in all directions. The walls are made up of some glassy substance. A marble stairway leads upward. Here we're going to go south. This is a room with an oddly angled walls and passages in all directions. The walls are made of some glassy substance. On the floor is a very small diamond-shaped window, which is flickering dimly. A long wooden club winds on the ground near the diamond-shaped window. The club is curiously burned at the thick end. So let's get the club. And we are in the oddly angled room. We have to walk the oddly angled room a certain sequence in order to solve this puzzle. You may remember from the beginning when I did the opening, I mentioned baseball. Well, let's see if you make sense of what we're doing here. We want to start by going southeast. Notice that on the floor, the very small diamond window is dimly glowing. Then we want to go northeast. And then we want to go northwest. And see now it is glowing brightly. And now we want to go southwest. You hear a strange rusty squeal echoing in the distance. And then the diamond shaped window is glowing serenely. Now let's head back the direction we were coming from. Let's head north. And then we want to go up to the stairway. Then we're going to go north to the Minhir room. North again 
to the carousel room where we go southwest to the cobwebby corridor and southwest again. This is the guarded room. It's cobwebby and musty, but tracks in the dust show that it's seen visitors recently. At the south end of the room is a stained and battered but very strong looking door. To the north, the corridor exits. Embedded in the door is a rather nasty looking lizard head with sharp teeth and beady eyes. The lizard is sniffing at you. So let's feed the lizard the candy. The guardian greedily wolfs down the candy, including the package. It seems to enjoy the grasshoppers particularly. It then becomes quiet and its eyes close. Lizards are known to sleep a long time while digesting their meals. So let's unlock the door with the gold key. The key turns and the bolt clicks. The door is unlocked. And then we're going to open the door. The door creaks open. We go south into the wizard's workshop. We're standing in the entry hall of the wizard's workshop. Dark corridors lead west and south from here. The corridor to the west smells slightly of incense or candle smoke. The workshop door is open. We're going to go west. This is the wizard's workroom. This room is the wizard's laboratory. A hall continues east and west, and a larger room lies to the south. There are many shelves and racks on the walls, but the wizard's workbench dominates the room. It's made of a dark, heavy wood bound with iron. The workbench is stained from many years of use and is deeply gouged as though some huge clawed animal was imprisoned on it. There are burn marks and even notes written in a crabbed hand. Many arcane items are scattered about the bench. Alembics, mortar and pestle, small knives of various sizes, odd scrapes of vellum, wax candles, and much more. In the center of a relatively clear area of the bench are affixed three stands which form a triangle. Sitting on the wizard's workbench is a ruby stand, a diamond stand, a sapphire stand. So let's drop all but the lamp. And now we are going to go for another very long walk. We're going to go east into the workshop, north into the guarded room, and then we're going to go north again into the cobwebby corridor. And here we go northeast. And this is back into the carousel room where we go north to the marble hall, north again, the deep ford, north again, to the ledge in the ravine, where we go west to the end of the ledge, and then we go north to the dragon room. We go west to the fresco room. A path leads east-west through the room decorated with beautiful frescoes of someone battling dragons and rescuing fair maidens. It's hard to tell who is doing this, as those parts of the frescoes have been blackened and cracked by intense heat. The dragon was not very happy with those paintings, was he? Let's go west again to the bank entrance. This is the entrance hall of the Bank of Zork, the largest banking institution in the great underground empire. A partial account of its history is in the lives of the 12 flatheads in ch the chapter on J. Pierpoint Flathead. A more detailed history, albeit less objective, may be found in Flathead's outrageous autobiography, I'm Rich and You Aren't, So There. Most of the furniture has been ravaged by passing scavengers. All that remains are two signs at the northwest and northeast corners of the room, which say, Viewing rooms, the way out, ornate but tasteful, is to the east. So we are going to go northeast. East Teller's room. You're in a small room which was used by a bank officer who retrieved safety deposit boxes for the customer. On the north side of the room is a sign which reads viewing room. On the east side of the room, above an open door, is a sign reading bank personnel only. Let's go east. Safety Depository. This is a large rectangular room. The east and west walls were used for storing safety deposit boxes, but have all been carefully removed by evil persons. To the east, west, and south of the room are large doorways. The northern wall of the room is shimmering curtain of light. In the center of the room is a large stone cube about 10 feet on a side. Engraved on the side of the cube is some lettering. On the ground is a small worn piece of paper. 
So let's read the paper. The paper is barely readable. I can make out only valuables are completely safe, advanced magic technology, impossible to take valuables from the depository, either tellers, many customers faint, teller pops in, seems to walk through, walls. So let's drop the paper. And then we are going to go south to the chairman's office. This room was the office of the chairman of the Bank of Zork. Like the other rooms here, it has been extensively vandalized. The lone exit is to the north. A portrait of J. Pierpont Flathead hangs on the wall. So let's get the portrait. I don't know the word portrait. I am terrible at spelling this word. Get portrait. And then we're going to go north again, back into the safety depository. And remember, there was a curtain of light. We want to enter the light, because that's what the paper told us to do, enter the light. You feel somewhat disoriented as you pass through. Small room. This is a small, bare room with no distinguishing features. There are no exits from the room. So let's enter the south wall. In other words, going south. You feel somewhat disoriented as you pass through. Safety depository. There is a bank brochure here. And now let's enter the light again. You feel somewhat disoriented as you pass through. Notice this time we're in the vault. This is the vault of the Bank of Zork, in which there are no doors. On the floor sit 200 neatly stacked Zorkmid bills. So let's get the bills. And now let's do something really fun. Now this is not the only solution for this, but I happen to like it. Poof, you're dead. You have died. Now let's take a look here. Well, you probably deserve another chance. I can't quite fix you up completely, but you can't have everything. Room of red mist. You're inside a huge crystalline sphere filled with thin red mist. The mist becomes blue to the west. You strain to look out through the mist. As you peer through the mist, a strangely colored vision of a huge room takes shape. Wizard's workroom. This room is the wizard's laboratory. A hall continues east and west, and a larger room lies to the south. There are many shelves and racks on the walls, but a wizard's workbench dominates the room. See, we've already been here, and we're already used to this, all the way down to the three stands which form the triangle. And there's the things that we dropped. Now, why do I like this? I like this because of the mist, which, you know, we recently did the mist together. We're going to go west. And this puts us back into the room of blue mist. You're inside a huge crystalline sphere. Does it look familiar? Well, let's do it again. Now we are in the room of white mist, inside a huge crystalline sphere filled with a thin white mist. The mist becomes black to the west, strain to look out through the mist. Strange blurry room is barely visible. An odd sinuous shadow crosses the mist as you look. Let's go west again. You follow a corridor of black mist into a black walled spherical room. As you enter, a huge horrible face materializes out of the mist. What brings you here to trouble my imprisonment, wanderer? It asks. Hearing no immediate answer, it studies you for a moment. Perhaps you may be of some use to me in gaining my freedom from this place. Return to your foolish quest. I shall not destroy you this time. Mayhap you will repay this favor in kind some day. The face vanishes and the mist begins to swirl. When it clears, you are returned to the world of life inside the paro. There is a lamp here. So let's get the lamp. And then we want to head to the gazebo. Since this is where we started originally, we're just going to follow our previous path of going south until we get to the Great Cavern. And you will see that the wizard popped in, and this time he spoke the word fireproof, which is really a helpful spell and really helps with things like the dragon. So we will go southwest from here into the shallow ford where we will go south. And we will go southeast. And here we enter the gazebo. 
see there's a lot of things here. We need some of these. So let's go ahead and start picking them up. We want the violin and the ruby and the zork mid and the stamp and the crown. So let's head out. And then we're going to go south, south, west, southwest, southwest again, south, and west. So we're back in the wizard's workroom and we want to drop everything but the lamp. And then get the club. Now let's go west with the club to the aquarium room. Here in a dark hallway turns a corner. To the south is a dark room. To the east is a fitful light. Filling the northern half of the room is a huge aquarium. The aquarium contains a baby sea serpent. So let's throw the club at the glass. In case you haven't noticed by now the club where we got it originally, this is a baseball bat. The wooden club shatters the glass wall of the aquarium, spilling out an impressive amount of salt water and wet sand. It also spills out an extremely annoyed sea serpent who bites angrily at the wooden club and then at you. He's having a difficult breathing, and he seems to hold you responsible for his current problem. He tries to slither across the stone towards you. Fortunately, he expires mere inches away from biting off your foot. A clear crystal sphere sits amid the sand and broken glass at the bottom of the aquarium. So let's get the sphere. And then we are going to go east. We are back in the wizard's workroom where there are tons of things on the floor. And we want to put the sphere on the diamond stand. And then we want to put the red sphere on the ruby stand. And then we want to put the blue sphere on the sapphire stand. As you place the blue crystal sphere in the sapphire stand, a low humming noise begins and you can feel the hairs on the back of your neck begin to stand up. The three spheres begin to vibrate faster and faster. As the noise becomes higher and higher pitched, three puffs of smoke, one red, one blue, one white, rise up from empty stands. The spheres are gone. But in the center of the triangle formed by the stands is now a black stand of obsidian on which rests a strange black sphere. So we're going to get the black sphere. And then go south. This is the pentagram room. In this room inscribed on the floor is a great pentagram drawn with black chalk. In its center is a black circle. So let's put the sphere in the circle. A cold wind blows outward from the sphere. The candles flicker and a low moan, almost inaudible, is heard. It rises in volume and pitch until it becomes a high-pitched keening. A dim shape becomes visible in the air above the sphere. The shape resolves into a large, somewhat formidable-looking demon. He looks around, tests the walls of the pentagram experimentally, then sees you. Hmm, a new master, he says under his breath. Greetings, O oh master. Wouldst desire a service? As our contract stateth, for some pithiance of a wealth, some trifle, I will gratify thy desires to the utmost limit of my powers, and they are not inconsiderable. He makes a pass with his massive arms at the walls and begins to shake a litter. Another pass, and the shaking stops. 
a nice effect. I find it makes for a better relationship to give such a demonstration early on. Now we need to go get some stuff. He wants payment. We're going to pay him. So we go north back into the wizard's workroom. As you see, there is a lot of stuff here. And we are going to get the ruby, the coin, the stamp, and the violin. And from here, we go back south into the room where the demon is. Suddenly, the wizard materializes in the room. He is astonished by what he sees, his servant in deep conversation with a common adventurer. He draws forth his wand and waves it frantically and incants, Frobiz, Frobazel, Frobnoid. The demon laughs heartily. You no longer control the black crystal hedge wizard. Your wand is powerless. Your doom is sealed. The demon turns to you expectantly. So what we want to do is we want to give everything we're carrying except the lamp to the demon. Fancy violin. Oh, truly magnificent. Keep them coming. Flathead stamp. Almost halfway there, oh worthy one. Priceless zork mid. Oh, such beauty. Your generosity almost overwhelms me. Ruby, truly I shall do thee a wonderful service when thou hast finished. And here we go north again, back to that room. And we want to take everything that we can. And then we are going to go south again. And we are going to give all but the lamp to the demon. Pearl necklace. Truly you are most generous, but still, this is not yet enough. Golden dragon statuette. A fine gift, mighty one. You have almost reached my fee. The wizard looks at you as if you are a madman. He tears his beard and stares at you fearfully. Delicate gold key. Wondrous fine master, but one treasure is yet to be given. Gaudy crown. This will do for my fee. Tis a paltry hoard, but as you have done me a small service by loosening me from this wizard, it will suffice. Now we want to tell the demon give me the wand. Now we could tell the demon to kill the wizard, but that doesn't seem like a very fun thing for the wizard. I hear and obey, says the demon. He stretches out an enormous hand toward the wand. The wizard is unsure what to do, pointing it threateningly at the demon, then at you. Fudge, he cries, but aside from a strong odor of chocolate in the air, there is no effect. The demon plucks the wand out of his hand. It's about a toothpick size to him, and gingerly lays it before you. He fades into the smoke, which disperses, and the wizard runs from the room in terror. Now let's get the wand. And then we're going to head back the direction we came from. And then we'll go east, north, north, northeast, south. We are in the Minhir room. Let's look again. Remember here, there is a large Minhir, at least 20 feet tall and 8 feet thick, leaning against a wall blocking a dark opening leading southwest. We needed the wand in order to move this Minhir. So let's follow the instructions we were given by the book earlier. Wave wand at in here and say float. The wand grows warm. The enormous min here seems to glow dimly with magical essences and you feel suffused with power. The wand glows very brightly for a moment. The min here floats majestically into the air, rising about 10 feet. The passage beneath it beckons invitingly. So now let's go southwest. We are in the kennel. This room looks like it was once a kennel for a very large dog. Some of the bones would fit a dinosaur. It is apparently hasn't been used for a very long time as the dust is fairly thick all over. 
the only exit is to the northeast. A gigantic dog collar large enough for three rhinoceros-sized dogs is lying amidst the debris. So let's get the collar. And then we are going to go northeast to the Minhir room, south to the stairway. We're going to go down the stairway, oddly angled room. The floor is a small diamond-shaped window, which is glowing serenely. And we'll go down again to the Cerberus room. This is the entrance to a huge crypt or tomb. A marble stairway leads up from a gateway arch. There is a vicious looking dog guarding the entrance. It is more or less your usual dog, except that it has three heads. One, two, three, and they're about the size of an elephant. Great. You noticed we picked up the collar. There's a reason for us getting the collar. We want to put the collar on the dog. The creature whines happily, then the center head licks your face, which is roughly like experiencing a sandpaper washcloth. The other two heads look about, as though the monster felt a sudden need to find a pair of slippers somewhere. Its huge tail wags enthusiastically, knocking small rocks around and almost blowing you over from the breeze it creates. So now we're going to go east. The Crypt Anteroom. The anteroom is large and empty. Marble bas reliefs depict the stirring times and afterlife of the flatheads, the latter a bit optimistically. The exit is to the west. A huge marble door stands to the south. The door is closed. Above the door is the cryptic inscription, Feel Free. Feel Free is just a inside joke that has to do with one implementer telling another implementer when they want to make changes. Feel free. So let's open the door. The crypt door squeaks open and we head south. This room contains the earthly remains of the mighty flatheads, 12 somewhat flatheads mounted securely on poles. While the room might be expected to contain funerary urns or other evidence of ritual practices of the ancient Zorkers, it's empty of all such objects. There is writing carved on the crypt. The only apparent exit is to the north, through the door of the anteroom. The door is open. Now, in order to see our exit, we actually have to violate one of our previous rules and turn off the lamp. The lamp is now off. It is dark, but on the south wall is a faint outline of a rectangle, as though the light were shining around a doorway. You can also make out a faintly glowing letter in the center of this area. It might be an F. So let's open the secret door. The secret door opens noisily, and then head south. Beyond the door is a roughly hewn staircase leading down into the darkness. The landing on which you stand is covered with carefully drawn magic runes like those sketched upon the workbench of the Wizard of Frobaz. These have been overlaid with sweeping green lines of enormous power, which undulate back and forth across the landing. The wand begins to vibrate in harmony with the motion of the lines. You feel yourself compelled downward, and you yield, stepping onto the staircase. As you pass the green lines, they flare and disappear with a burst of light, and you tumble down the staircase. At the bottom of a vast red-lit hall stretches off into the distance. Sinister statues guard the entrance to a dimly visible room far ahead. With courage and cunning, you have conquered the Wizard of Frobaz and become the master of his domain. But the final challenge awaits. The ultimate adventure concludes in Zork III, the Dungeon Master. Your score would be 386, out of a possible total of 400 in 347 moves. This gives you the rank of Superior Adventurer. Eldos is now ready. So, can you see why this game only sold about a third of the total games Zork 1 had sold by 1986? Other than the obvious answer, many people who purchased Zork 1 did not complete it and were too intimidated to get Zork 2. As I told you in the opening, chances were we would not get the full score. And part of it is my doing, because I just did not want to use up everything possible in this game and deprive you of the chance to complete it yourself. I mean it. I would really like to see some 400-point scores from some of you. I've already shown you how to get through the game and the solutions to many of the puzzles. So have at it. 
I honestly do not think the puzzles here were very hard. Maybe because Zork 1 had really primed the pump and it felt like I was just doing the same old, same old. Maybe you felt different, but one thing for certain is the game is all about get this and bring it here so you can do the thing. Rinse, repeat. And that's fine for a game, and back then it was really novel. But in our world of gaming as we know it now, that sums up every single story quest in every single MMO. Or every single side quest in every open world game. And it's become very tiresome. Does that detract from this game? Not for me at least. I'm able to take these games in context. Seriously, that is part of my whole thing after all. And I hope you, who joined me, you know who you are, have been able to do the same thing, because this game, though not as groundbreaking as Zork 1, is still amazing. So in honor of that, you be amazing too. Like and or subscribe, which is the amazing thing to do these days. Send me a message, post one here, let me see those scores. Fill out a request form, I love those. I need more of them. And if you have any ideas on how I can improve things, make it more interesting, let me know. I'll be happy to do what I can. But until then, seriously, be kind to yourself and others. Be safe. And I look forward to our next adventure together.